The story that I'm reading to you today is a story known as The Cleansing of the Temple. And it's a story that appears in the other Gospels toward the end of Jesus' ministry, just before he is arrested. But in John, it's different. It's right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It is the festival of the Passover in this story, as it is in the others. But Passover actually happens three times in John, which is why we believe that Jesus' ministry lasted for three years. So this incident happens near the beginning of Jesus' time with his disciples and following the wedding at Cana. So listen now to these words from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25, and listen to what the Spirit is saying to you today through this reading. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Will the children come forward now?
Beautiful. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so before the beginning of the year, I had decided that I needed to start exercising again and start eating healthier and hopefully losing some of the weight that I had gained during quarantine. I, I started not exercising and, and eating bad food about two years ago. <laughs> And I kind of just didn't stop. So I was looking around and talking to people about programs that would help me do these things and what had helped them and what was sustainable. And then I, I started getting a lot of ads telling me I should start with a cleanse. You all know what this is? It doesn't sound good. There were little shakes I could drink and all kinds of stuff. I saw. I saw this one TV show when a whole bunch of college-age women were going to do a watermelon cleanse when all they did was eat watermelon for about three days, and that just did not sound like a good, healthy thing for me. So, not doing that. But the idea is that you're cleaning out the body so that you can start out with good, nutritious food, and that will enhance your health and fitness. So, okay. Didn't do that, but sometimes it's necessary to clean out and start fresh. This is an appealing idea for good reason, and sometimes even Jesus apparently is in favor of a healthy cleanse, if not for our physical bodies, at least in some parts of our lives. Everyone needs a fresh start, even if we're not always aware of that need. So Jesus' disruption of the temple was a disturbing physical act, one that certainly would have gotten him arrested and put in jail if it happened today. It wasn't a loss of control or a temper tantrum. Some people have called this the temple tantrum. <laughs> it's not really that. I know, right? But this was an intentional interruption of the status quo, and it obviously disturbed the Jewish leaders who confronted him, but it must have disturbed everyone else who was there as well, the vendors and the visitors and the pilgrims, because the fact is that exchanging money and buying animals for sacrifice was an absolutely normal and perfectly legal thing for people to do when they came to Jerusalem for Passover. Making these symbolic sacrifices was an important part of worship in this sacred place which held the very presence of God. And it always had been an important part of that ritual. When people came from far away, it didn't make sense for them to haul animals with them the whole way. So there were always animals for sale in the courtyard that they could buy. It was simple as that. And here comes Jesus telling them all that the religious traditions that they had had for generations were wrong. Not just telling them, but driving the animals out and letting the doves fly away and tumping over the tables with the money. This is people's livelihood. Who is this man, anyway? Who is this man? Who is this person who would come to God's house and cause such trouble? Because just before that, they were humming a hymn. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this temple. And then... They were getting trampled on by stampeding sheep. They would never forget that Passover. So much for feeling the presence of the Lord here in this temple, here in God's house. But according to Jesus, that was pretty much the point. Because listen to what he says. The Jewish leaders confront him and they say, what sign can you show us for doing this? In other words, give us a good reason for you coming in here and causing such a mess. We want to know what you're thinking. 
And Jesus answers them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews say, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Then the scripture says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Later, after his resurrection, people would remember what he said. Destroy this temple. Destroy this place where the Spirit of God resides. And in three days, it will be resurrected. In three days, I will be raised. The good news that Jesus is presenting here is this. That in him, in Jesus himself, the presence of God resides. Remember chapter 1, the prologue, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The Word, the essence of God, the presence of God, became a person, and came to our town, came to Jerusalem, came to Rome, came to Houston. The word of God, the presence of God, is here in this place. Later, Paul would write to the first churches that the Spirit of God resides in each of you. The Spirit of God resides not only in a temple, not only in a building, not even only in Jesus, but now in you yourself. Now maybe this is disturbing news that we can't just go to the place where God is and then leave God behind when we go home. That would be easier sometimes, I think. But this is good news as well, because the presence of our loving God is with you when you're here and when you're not here, in your highs and your lows. As we say in weddings, in times of sickness and times of health, in times of joy and in times of strife. But we'll have to get out of the way when the stampede starts. Because every now and then, just like the temple, we all need to be cleansed. And I don't mean with a spray bottle and paper towels. And I don't mean with watermelon. So the big question is this, what do you need to be cleansed of? What is in you that is pulling you farther away from your relationship with God? What is in you that would be offensive or off-putting to Jesus? What are you holding on to that needs to be disrupted or disturbed? I'm going to suggest a couple things and you can decide if they apply to you or not. First, apathy. We need to be cleansed of apathy. The scripture says that Jesus was consumed with zeal for God's house. Consumed with zeal. What are you consumed with zeal for? What is it that no matter what, you will always have time and energy to attend to? Maybe it's your children or your grandchildren. Maybe it's your job or your friends. Maybe it's your health or physical fitness. Or maybe it's the work of discipleship. Do you always make time for prayer and studying scripture and listening for God's guidance and working for justice and peace as God wants us to do? Apathy is awfully easy to fall into, and this is something that I'm guilty of, because it feels like the little things that I do aren't going to make any difference. And if I don't read scripture one day, it's not going to be a big deal in the long run. I'm just one person. The world is spinning out of control. There's that prayer that says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. 
but frankly, most of the time I'm just needing lots of serenity because it seems like there's nothing I can change. Apathy is helplessness, and apathy is not God's will for us. God desires our zeal, not only for a personal relationship with God, but for our working in the world according to his commands. Do you need to be cleansed of apathy? Ask God for that zeal. Pray for that. Turn over those tables. And secondly, I think, something that has consumed our society. Do we need to be cleansed of this fear? I don't want to be naive about this because obviously there are a lot of things in our world to be afraid of. But the more media we consume, the more afraid we become. The more rumors we hear, the more worries fill our minds. And when we're afraid, our lizard brains take over and we don't even think clearly anymore. In addition to our COVID epidemic, I think we have an epidemic of fear in our world. And most of us as individuals have been affected by that. Most of us need to uncage the fears that we harbor and let them fly away like doves. It's not easy, and it takes a deliberate effort on our part and with God's help. But we need to start by acknowledging what our fears are and exploring how they've impacted our lives. If we live in constant anxiety, we'll never be the people that God dreams that we can be. We have so much to rejoice in and so much to be confident about if only we can get past that fear. The affirmation of faith that I've chosen for us during this epiphany season is from Paul's letter to the Romans. And part of it says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate us? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. This is the assurance that God gives us all. Who will separate us? No one. Nothing. Not even death can separate us from the love of God and from the presence of Jesus Christ. Friends, pray for cleansing this week, whatever kind of cleansing you need. And if you don't want to pray for release from these things for yourself, if you're not ready to let go of whatever is holding you back, then pray for me. Pray for the people you care about. Pray for the stranger on the corner. Ask God to cleanse you in whatever way you need and give thanks For Jesus, the Word made flesh, who has come to live with us. Amen.